Hi, it's hot chat time. It is time for us to have a hot conversation. I am Sharon Pender, President and CEO of the Capital Region Minority Supply Development Council and the operator of the U.S. Department of Commerce Minority Business Development Agency Business Center, Washington, D.C., and the MBDA Federal Procurement Center. The council serves the state of Maryland, Washington, D.C., and Northern Virginia. Welcome to Hotcast Podcast, Minority Business Connection, Season 1. This is Episode 6. And so if it's your first time, we welcome you. And you can go back and see the other um, five episodes if you'd like. If, it's, it's, if you're returning, um, thank you for continuing on this journey with us because we have some great um, conversation for you today. Today, it is with Dr. Irving McConnell, owner of the McConnell Group. Today, Dr. McConnell will discuss how his organization is coping during this pandemic and how they had to pivot. This is a continuation of our special series of show, of showcasing rather MBEs, the untold stories of MBEs and how they survive during the pandemic, this historic pandemic. You know, it's our mission to continue to feature dynamic one-on-one -on -one conversations with CEOs, contracting officers, minority businesses, supply diversity professionals, and procurement leaders from, from, from some of the leading companies in America via our hot chat podcast discussions. We will highlight the challenges, success stories, resources, and opportunities that exist for our vast network of minority businesses. And we'll continue to spotlight our corporate members who share their vision to drive economic success and development and inclusion within the organizations around the country. But more importantly, we want to hear from you as we continue to cur um, curate stories. But you know, um, before we kind of go on, I'd like to acknowledge in the beginning of this conversation, some of our premier sponsors, folks that believe in the vision and BGE and Exelon Company and Pepco Holdings and Exelon Company. That's why Exelon is our title sponsor. Southwest Airlines, Hilton, Amcus, Capital One, CompuGain, JDC Events, SB and Company, and Shroud Priest, Attorneys at Law. Let's bring on our guest for this um, session. And that's the Dr. Irving W. McConnell. He's the founder and chief executive officer of the McConnell Group, a health sciences company. The McConnell Group has dedicated more than three decades of professional life conducting and overseeing R&D facilities. How are you doing, Dr. McConnell? Oh, fantastic. Uh, life's good. Fantastic. Life's good. Uh, I love the positivity. Dr. McConnell, ladies and gentlemen, has managed numerous multidisciplinary research staff and held multiple positions at Shearing Cloud to include toxic toxologist, veterinarian, ophthalmologist, and laboratory animal veterinarian. You know, is it a requirement to be able to pronounce um, seven syllable words? I don't know. He has also served as senior staff veterinarian for Smith Klein. Beecham and has held several senior management positions within Johnson & Johnson to include Director of Toxology and Laboratory Animal Medicine. He served active duty at the Walter Reed Institute of Research, Naval Medical Research Institute, and the U.S. Army Aeromedical Research Laboratory in Fort Rucker, Alabama. He continued his military service in the Army Reserves for over 20 years and special operations serving in multiple um, overseas assignments to include Iraq. He was later appointed to the DOD, Department of Defense Global Emergency, Emerging Infectious Surveillance and Response System Division, where he was the assistant deputy for, for influenza and zoonot, zoon, zoon, zoonotis? Zoonotic. Uh, uh, Say that again? Zoonotic. You have to explain what is that? So the, the interesting thing, a lot of people don't realize with all the diseases that we have around the world, 70% of them are zoonotic, which means they can get those diseases from animals. Uh, so people can get diseases from animal or they can get those diseases uh, from people also. So when you, when you have that transboundary of diseases, it's called uh, zoonotic. So was that part of discussion with this pandemic? And they were talking about in China. No. 
no and, question about it. Yep. No okay. question about it. Yep. Um, and so, um, so over the years, you've seen where there has been that direct correlation between disease. Oh, that yeah. human, okay. Can you give some examples on that? Well, when you hear about like swine flu and avian flu, okay. Uh, when you hear about the uh, Ebola virus, you know, you know, every everybody wanted to know where Ebola came from. And uh, when you look back in in, in Africa, the Colobus uh, monkey. Uh, actually had, had been found with uh, uh, Ebola. And then, but even earlier on when HIV came out, people didn't realize there was a simian uh, HIV also. Uh, so HIV mean, meaning human, but the simian virus was already in, in, in primates. So the primate was that animal model. So when you look at some of these diseases, animals actually become that model for a lot of these different uh, uh, diseases that we have now today. So how has that been transmitted? And I'm sorry, I jumped right into this conversation because it just fascinates me. Yeah. Uh, not even give it back. Well, I'm going to come back and talk about how you even got into this, um, um, you know, your your um, choice, your yeah. career choices. Yeah. How does that trans how transfer from animal to human? So it depends on the actual disease because it can be something that's transmitted through through uh, uh, respiratory. Mm -hmm. Or be, you know, from 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 blood and and from bites. So it depends on on the actual um, uh, animal. So if you look at um, uh, even like uh, uh, rabies, if you go down to Trinidad, I was actually able to set up the rabies lab in the Ministry of Health in Trinidad because uh, people don't realize there are bat caves in Trinidad, and those bats come out and they land on little kids at nighttime and give them uh, rabies. So a few years back, uh, I was down there doing the training, setting up the rabies lab. And it was one of the most amazing things because they had an outbreak of rabies right after that. And Trinidad had the lab that I was able to build up. And they actually named the lab the McConnell Laboratory in the Ministry wow. in Trinidad. So you know, I've been very blessed to, to be part of some amazing programs. Very blessed. So let's talk about how it starts. So, you know, immediately what comes to mind is like, oh, he's one of those prodigy people, you know, one of those really smart people, right? And so how did it all start for you? Where did you grow up? So I'm actually that inner city kid of Washington, D.C. But what's, what's interesting, my father was a photographer at the National Institute of Health. And back in the day, believe it or not, wow. mm -hmm. you know, he could actually, you know, he knew people that worked in the animal areas, the NIH. So he would bring, you know, mice home or rats home and ducks. So I became that Dr. Doolittle you know, <laughs> in the inner city of uh, DC. So when people had a problem with their animal, they would always call me and I just would try to figure out how, how, how to help. And so early on, I just wanted to be a veterinarian. So early on, your dad's bringing home rodents. Right. And you're, what are you doing with these rodents in the inner city of Washington, D.C.? Just trying to make them live. And then uh, uh, we, you know, we had a dog. OK. Uh, and um, uh, so what I, what I what I enjoyed about dogs, I had a, I've, I've always have a, I had a German Shepherd and I, and I have one today. And um, what I realized growing up in the city, uh, because I had a German Shepherd, I never had a problem of people wanting to beat me up or take advantage of me because people knew I was the guy that had the big German shepherd. And, <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and so it was my defense mechanism where I didn't have to worry about, you know, anything, you, you know, cause we're, you know, where I grew up, they had to, you know, back then they had to, like the, the Cater street gang and all these, but everybody knew me as the guy with the, with the big German shepherd. And, and, and uh, we did not have any, uh, veterinarians in the Washington D.C. area to mm -hmm. the point that we have now. So I had to go out, go around, and just look at other veterinarians. So when I was growing up, um, there was a, a Dr. Weber and Joe Barr were the only two African American veterinarians in the Washington D.C. area, uh, but they were far away from me. So I would go to the uh, local vet and then just take my dog there just to walk in just to see what it was like. And uh, interesting. Uh, yeah, 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 
Yeah. So I'm curious. So veterinarians were located in what parts of Washington, D.C.? They weren't in our neighborhoods. Right, right. So uh, Weber was off of uh, Florida Avenue and uh, Joe Barr was over in District Heights. And and and, and the interesting mm -hmm. thing, we, we literally just created a scholarship uh, for kids just a couple of months ago, meaning the Tuskegee Veterinary uh, Medical Asso Association, the local group in the name of Weber and Joe Barr, because, you know, these are the guys that uh, were the legacy guys to that influenced, you know, a lot of us to become uh, a, vet a veterinarian. When you look at minority veterinarians, African-American veterinarians are only 2% of all veterinarians. So uh, kids are out there looking for, the, for that role model. So most of us are doing like double duty you know, just trying to be role models for kids that want to be veterinarians. And uh, there seems to be an, an, a growing, um, I would I would imagine, um, a growing demand for veterinarians because there's a lot of folks who, um, I mean, I, I grew up in Baltimore and it seemed like everybody had a dog, but there's a lot of folks now who have a lot of animals um, yeah. and, and they spend a lot of uh, money with their animals. And so it seems yeah. like there's, well, I would imagine there's an increase Demand yeah. veterinarians. Okay. Yeah, and the, and the business of veterinary medicine is something that I'm very interested in because even within the medical profession and the veterinary profession, we don't teach the business of those sciences. So when you talk about uh, being a veterinarian in a in a neighborhood, uh, you can do that, or you can work for a corporation mm -hmm. uh, at the veterinary clinic. So one of the things that I'm always pushing is the whole entrepreneurship of uh, building your own wealth. So instead of going from one of the corporate uh, uh, veterinary clinics, create your own corporation and develop mm. multiple businesses because it's very, very hard to have a veterinary clinic on your own uh, because it, it is a busy, busy job doing surgeries all day long and seeing patients all day long. Uh, but if you have multiple people working for you and understand that business process, you can do extremely well. But that's something that we're just starting to talk about and just starting to teach you know, our, our students how to look at the business of these professions. I think that is a very, very, very good point. I'm going to jump back now into growing up. And so yep. when you went, um, so you grew up in Washington, D.C. And um, where did you go to uh, undergrad? So let's just back up one because I'm really proud of the high school that 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 I went to. Okay. So I, I was I was very fortunate uh, again being in D.C. But there was a school that was in Virginia that uh, developed a lot of kids from you know D.C. from Baltimore, Philly, Tuskegee, called Saint Emma Military Academy, and Saint Emma Military Academy has been the only African-American military academy ever in the United States. It actually closed in, I think, like 72, but, you know, from years early, from the 50s to the 70s, it was, you know, we, we produced a lot of great uh, men out of boys, and St. Francis was the girls' school in there. So after St. Emma, I went to Tuskegee, uh, which is down in Alabama, because if you wanted to be a veterinarian, at that particular time, Tuskegee graduated probably like 90, at that time, probably like 98% of all African-American veterinarians uh, because the other schools would not uh, uh, allow you to come in. So there was no option for me at that particular time. So I pretty much had to go to uh, uh, Tuskegee and going there changed my whole life. Uh, so let me, ask, let me yeah. ask you a question, Dr. Uh, McConnell. So at the high school, which I'm glad you, you mentioned that at, at the high school, was that intentional for you to go there because you wanted to be a veterinarian or was because it was a military school and you in, ended up serving in the service? It was, it was a school that uh, young men that needed discipline. I try to tell people. I, I, I really wasn't going to ask you that question because, you know, yeah, you, yeah, you, yeah, you, yeah, they, you sent him to the military. So they got, got got him off the streets and sent him to military. Yeah, school. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay. yeah, I always tell people I was I was the I was the good kid that uh, uh, was always there. But uh, I became an entrepreneur 
in 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 high school, you know, because we had uh, Dr. McConnell. Uh, you weren't on, so you were you were hustling. What? Go ahead. Uh, uh, baby Ruth's uh, old girl cookies because <laughs> uh, we would have a movie. We would have a movie night, and nobody uh -huh. would take candy. So I would literally just buy a uh, a gym bag full of candy and oatmeal cookies. And, 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 and back then they were a nickel and I would sell them for a quarter. And <laughs> they would get upset that I was overcharging them. And, uh, and, 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 and that's where I just realized I just started seeing the opportunities Opportunity. about the demand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's yeah. excellent. So yeah. Tuskegee, of course, which is just renowned Yes. And um, what it does. So tell me um, what you said that was life changing for you. What, yeah. what was yeah. that? That that aha for you there. Yeah. So you know, being from the uh, uh, the city, you know, I didn't have a lot of exposure with farm animals, and and Tuskegee gave me that mm. that opportunity. And and uh, when, you know, when I look back at my life, uh, it, it, you know, was I the, the 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 smartest guy on the block? No, not really. But Tuskegee really helped nurture me uh, to be who I am today. And 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 that's why I've you know I've been very very active with the university uh, since the day I graduated because I really feel uh, if there was no Tuskegee, you know where mm. would I be today? And, and 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 I say that again, if there was no Tuskegee, you know where a lot of us would be because Tuskegee has a lot of rich rich history. Um, you know when people know from the. Charles, uh, Charles Drew story when he was leaving mm -hmm. Tuskegee. Uh, everybody knows about you know, you know Rosa Parks, but people don't know their influence in 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 Tuskegee. Uh, you know Valerie Jarrett's family, you know, is from Tuskegee. A lot of people don't know that. You know, so Tuskegee mm -hmm. is a really really rich town and uh, community. But from the university standpoint. Tuskegee, even to this day, uh, will take a risk on you and give you that opportunity if you show them you have what it takes. And 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 that's why I feel really, really grateful, uh, you know, having gone there. And and so when you fast forward and you do undergrad and you get exposed to all of the animal science classes. So Tuskegee had a unique program where you could major in, in animal science and they had an option to major in animal science with business. And I went that business option. And I try to tell most students now to go on this with the science piece, but take the business also because it will help you in your everyday life. So you take economics and you take accounting and those extra classes will actually help you in everyday life. But most people just want to take the science piece without understanding the advantage of the business. So when I went to vet school, I ran into a uh, dilemma uh, because it, it, the, the cost at that particular time didn't seem like a lot of money. Uh, but for me personally, uh, I didn't have the funds to uh, uh, pay for veterinary school. So I decided to look at an army scholarship that they had. Uh, and most of my friends were like, no, you, you don't go in the army. And I said, there's a scholarship called the the U.S. Army Health Professions Scholarship Program for medical doctors and dentists and veterinarians, where they will pay for all of your schooling, buy all of your books, buy all of your surgical instruments, everything that you need, and give you a stipend every month. And when you graduate, you go into the military. So that was a no-brainer for me. Okay. Uh, and so I, I literally walked out of veterinary school without owing any money to anyone. And, 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 and I try to still explain that to a lot of people to look at, but most people are just a little afraid or intimidated about joining the military because everybody thinks, you know, you're going to go, you know, to war, uh, you're going to be in combat, but everybody does not do that. Mm -hmm. uh, but for me, it was, uh, it, it, it was just so wonderful because uh, I got extra training um, you know, I came right back home to Washington, D.C. And, and, and worked at one of the most prestigious research facilities in the world at the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research. Okay. And uh, that was my first job. And, and I had one of the best mentors 
that I could have ever asked for. And and that mentor with that particular first job, you know, just sort of set me off in the research world. And I fell in love with the the what we call the R and D space, uh, from developing drugs to developing medical devices, uh, which which was just a really really great opportunity for me. Hmm. So that's 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 how it started. And then I went to the Naval Medical Research Institute in Bethesda, Maryland. Uh, at that particular time, I got a phone call one night from the Naval Academy that the uh, Naval Academy goat was dying. So I took the van from the research facility and went to Annapolis to get the Naval goat and brought it back to the research facility in Bethesda. And my boss, you know, didn't think that was a smart idea the next day when he <laughs> when saw this goat there. And he said, well, what's going to happen? And I said, well, I got to take care of this goat. And he said, well, what if it dies? That's going to be all in the news. Army. Right. Veterinarian kills naval goat. <laughs> I just told him, you know, it won't happen on my watch. Uh huh. So, that uh, is hilarious. So, so it worked out extremely well, and the goat was saved. And you know, I, I got to visit the naval academy for all kind of things after after saving the goats. So that okay. That, that, that worked out really well. And then, with the way the military works, they send you to different uh, opportunities. We call it. And my next opportunity was to go to, to uh, Fort Rucker, Alabama, which is the helicopter school. And my job was to help uh, develop night vision goggles and bulletproof vests. And and that took me into a whole nother area. That, and that was, was that the research and development part of you? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. And that was, again, t you know, taking me out of my comfort level. Uh, and, uh, and then I found that I was, you know, just that exposure gave me training to to go into a lot of different areas. And then at that point, I had finished that tour and the military wanted me to go to uh, Korea. And uh, and I decided to look at my options at that particular point because I had completed three tours, which paid back my time that I owed the military. Mm -hmm. and I, I decided to go into corporate America and, uh, and that's when I had my first job, in, you know, where I worked at Shearing Plow, but I went into the Army Reserves mm -hmm. at the same time. And what some people don't realize, there's one uh, uh, group within the U.S. Army uh, that has a special operations reserve group, and that's called Civil Affairs. Mm -hmm. I spent 20 years in Civil Affairs, literally going around the world, uh, developing programs in the area of... Uh, agriculture and and medical so if you look at classical classical swine <laughs> fever, i discovered classical swine fever in haiti uh back in 19 hold it hold it mm -hmm. step back again you did what now you discovered right classical swine fever which is a disease that was uh devastating the country of haiti mm -hmm. uh, and killing all of their pigs and uh so that was a a pivotal point in, in, in my life and career also. Uh, so that, 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 that particular opportunity, you know, gave me more of, of probably a larger network to look at infectious diseases also. Uh, so my, you know, wow. I, had to, I had to interact with the USDA. I, I uh, basically got on a, uh, a plane, which you should not be able to do, uh, with tissues and, and a facility in Plum Island, uh, uh, where we, which is the foreign animal disease mm -hmm. uh, facility for USDA. They actually did all the, the, the sampling of it. And then I went to the USDA and had a whole discussion with them. And, and then uh, uh, USDA decided to help Haiti uh, with this particular problem. Uh, and I was always fascinated with uh, infectious diseases anyway. It's, it's just something that I've enjoyed, uh, you know, doing doing my career. Yeah. Sounds like it can be a little bit dangerous as well, and so yeah, but that's the fun of it. That's, uh, that's the fun of it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, you know, I guess I guess my whole life has been around the the uh, uh, excitement uh, when 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 uh, because in civil affairs and special operations, uh, we're, we're we're the group that goes in. Uh, basically, when nobody else wants to go, uh, when when you look at uh, 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 Iraq, you know when that when that popped up, 
uh, you know, a lot of people are trying to figure out, well, why would a veterinarian have to go to Iraq for anything? But what people don't realize in Iraq, there were a lot of diseases in that particular country that mm. we didn't even know what was there because they didn't report any of the diseases. So I was the senior uh, uh, special ops veterinarian in Iraq. So my job was to look at diseases from Basra all the way to Baghdad. So I had a team that we would travel and do assessments around that whole area and then feed that information uh, back to the people that, that that needed to know what was going on. And and uh, fascinating. Yeah, it was a long, long time away from home, but uh, it was a great opportunity uh, uh, to be exposed to something like that. It and it's really great. interesting. I love how you characterize everything as opportunity. I have a burning question. I got to go back to the pigs in, in Haiti. Yeah. Sure. When you then um, go and I guess implement the 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 cure for because I would imagine that you know you you talk about the infectious disease in pigs, but that's that's going to impact food. It's going to impact a exactly. lot of things, correct? Yeah. 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 Uh, and so yeah. it's it's not just the pig as an animal. It's it's, it's the pig as a part of the the whole um, ecosystem. I would imagine. Yeah. Um, yep. And and so how how do you how do you deploy or implement? Um, so so the sad thing about it is that when you have something like uh, classical swine fever or or African swine fever, which are very similar, uh, that 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 devastate places like Haiti and and the uh, Dominican uh, uh, Republic, mm -hmm. uh, Haiti, and and this gets to be a political uh, uh, issue when you look at a disease in Haiti, you try to look at, you know, you know, how can you prevent it? You know, how can you stop it? And the decision that uh, higher ups made at that particular time uh, for Haiti was to let it run its course. Mm. And, 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 uh, uh, and, and that decision was, was, was made way above my pay grade. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I'm not going to say if I totally agree with it one way or the other, uh, but Haiti has has consistently got a uh, uh, got a bad shot at a lot of different times. Absolutely, it has. Uh, I remember yeah. during the, the whole immigration piece. Or absolutely, yeah, it has. yeah, yeah. yeah. And, you know, it's and it's devastation in terms of the the um, hurricanes and all that kind of stuff. You're absolutely right. Yeah, so that's interesting. Yeah, and I and 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 again, from a political point, you know, we had a lot of interest in the DR, uh, the uh, Dominican Republic, mm -hmm. and, I, and I and I love the DR, uh, but we, you know, basically, you know, again, way up above my pay grade, and and at that point, it wasn't a military operation; it was it was more of a, uh, a U.S. government operation to really decide to help the DR. Because when you have a disease on an island, and and the uh, Haiti and the and uh, the DR share the same land basically, and it's just split. But if you have a disease, uh, just like with COVID or anything else, it's going to get across the border, and 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 affect you know other animals, and that's that's what happened in the in the DR. But there was a uh, a plan to to stop that in the DR, but in Haiti, it sort of ran its course. Okay, and Dr. McConnell, and I'm gonna have to kind of jump jump over um, sure. some things because I want to get to. Um, I mean, you you certainly laid the foundation in in terms of you know the, your love of what you're doing and and how it has expanded into other areas. You know, the veterinarian science to the research and development mm -hmm. and other aspects of your your time in the service. How did you come to um, create? Um, the the um, McConnell group. Yeah, so interesting question. So I was working at Johnson and Johnson, and again, when you talk about mentors, uh, I had really really great mentors, and uh, my daughter had actually gotten sick, and um, nobody could figure out what was wrong with her. Hmm. She would have these stomach pains, and I would take her to the bus stop, and. Uh, uh, and, 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 and then she couldn't get on the bus. So I had to go back home with her. And then, you know, an hour later she was fine. So we ended up taking her to a GI specialist and we found out that she was uh, lactose intolerant. 
because in the area that I lived in, it wasn't an area with a lot of minorities. So the doctors were not really thinking about, you know, minority kid, minority kids, you know, really prone to you know, become lactose intolerant from milk. And uh, so when we found this out, I asked the, uh, the doctor's office, how did you diagnose this problem? And they told me that um, it, it was because um, of a breath analyzer machine that they had. And I said, could I look at it? And they showed it to me and I called the company up and said, uh, wow, this is a very interesting piece of equipment. And you had the only one. Uh, have you ever talked to Johnson and Johnson? And and uh, because J and J owned lactate, and uh, they said yeah. that okay. they, they had been trying to talk to to J and J for like ten years, and I said, well, let me see what I could do. So I knew the people in J and J, uh, and so you know it was my first time of really hearing what due diligence was. So you know J and J gave me the opportunity to do the due uh, diligence on this company, and I put a deal together and. Everybody did extremely well, and 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 at the day of the whole, uh, you know, grouping of both companies, uh, I was given a uh, lactate watch, you know, for the gift, and uh, and my boss talked to me after that, and she said, "Look, um, I just want you to know, I appreciate all the stuff you do for us, and I think it's time for you to go and start your own business." Wow. And she said, look at all the things you do. You're you're head of toxicology, you know, for this for you know, for this one company. You're head of the lab animal program. So you develop the drugs, you take care of the animals. Now you're bringing in new products to J and J. Uh, and and I said, nah, I'm I'm good. You know, I had the mini van <laughs> and the kids and, and I was like, no, nah, I'm I'm good. And she said, Look, trust me, you will be fine. And I went out. And, uh, you know, start, started the company in the basement, like most people do, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, started getting, I went back to my, you know, some of the old companies that I had worked at. Uh, Smith Klein gave me uh, a, a fantastic contract to do scientific lecture series uh, for the company. Uh, and then I had a, a, another company that I work with right now. Uh, that there's a research company that was buying supplies, a lot of research supplies, and he was complaining because he uh, had to pay so much money for them. I said, well, how much are you spending a year? He said, man, I spent a million dollars a year, and you would think I could get better pricing. And I said, well, let me see what I could do. So mm -hmm. I went out and contacted some of the companies, like the Thermo Fishers that you hear about and the BWR, which is now Avantor. And I became a supplier for those companies. And then I was, you know, ended up growing and I was able to get things from the same manufacturer. And uh, so I started providing to that one company. That's how we literally started selling supplies, you know, from one person having a need and looking at, well, how can I help that company with their problem? Uh, because he had told me what his problem was. And, and it's pretty easy to, to figure out you know, he was still a small business, but it's obvious that the the reps that were supporting him were not listening to him and realizing that he was willing to make a change. Okay. So I took that information to really start another segment of the business. So we call that side med. The side med division is our product side uh, of the business. And, and now we sell, you know, to the federal government and universities and 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 industry also and that's became a, a a major part of our business that, that's how it started oh wow when did you start it when did you start tmg yeah so that whole time frame was uh actually 1996. okay uh, yeah 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 okay. and uh, we started in 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 pennsylvania and uh so uh and, and it's interesting because uh the uh, Minority Supplier Development Council uh, became a very uh, integral part of our business, and uh, and and I, and I share this with you know I I um, I have a contract. I want a 15-year contract at a university, and the person that was running the contract opportunity asked me, "Was I a member of the Minority uh, Supplier Development Council?" 
And I said, yeah. And he said, which one? And I told him, he called them right on the phone when I was in his office to make sure I was telling the truth. It was really, it, yeah, 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 yeah. It was, it was really, really amazing. And, uh, uh, and then, and then they said, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Irving, yeah, we know Irving. He helps us out with all our programs and all that. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, this guy said he had never met a minority that was involved in biomedical research. And he said, we do a lot of that. And we just don't see companies like yours. So I bid it on a, a contract to run the uh, biomedical research program at this university. And not only did we win the contract uh, against a billion dollar company. Wow. Uh, I got the contract for 15 years. So I was about to comment on that. Yeah. How, is that a common occurrence in that yeah, industry? Never, I mean, never, 15 never, years? never, never, never. That's that's remarkable to me. Fifteen never. years. Yeah yeah, 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 never. And I think we're probably in like year like twelve now or something. Like you're maybe like okay. thirteen. Yeah, 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 yeah. That is so interesting. Yeah, huh. yeah. So yeah I, don't, I don't. I don't want to put the guy's name out there because everybody. You no, know, and I, I don't want you to. Right, yeah, yeah, but you yeah. were kicked out of your company to start yeah. your own. Yeah. And and things have kind of blossomed since then. When you look, and so that was you said nineteen ninety what six uh, nineteen six yeah yeah yeah, so, yeah 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 that's when we started the business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, when you look back over your shoulder, Doctor McConnell, what do you see as your biggest challenges and hurdles versus um, your your bigger wins? Yeah, so. Um, I'll tell you about a big win, but let me tell you about a, about a hurdle. Okay. Uh, because people constantly talk about um, funding for minority businesses. So the first contract uh, that I won in the federal government uh, was to manage the biomedical research program at CDC. And, um, um, and that was against, uh, the same company uh, that that I won this other contract against. So you became their nightmare. Oh, I still am. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah, yeah. Were you were you eight eight at the time? Were you have you ever been eight eight? Yeah, yeah. I was in the eight eight program, and uh, and and the good and the bad about the eight eight program is that I was in the eight eight program, did well, but I was not able to finish in the eight eight program. Because while I was in the 8 a program, um, I was I, I got called on active duty to go into Iraq. So mm -hmm. and then I got I got hurt while I was in Iraq. And then by the if you so if you look at the time from when I was in Iraq and then I was in the hospital, that was two years of my 8 a program. And wow. so I am the person that fought to change the rule, which has been changed. Uh, but my 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 uh, 8A rep in the in the Philadelphia area helped me with this, and we're responsible for changing that. If you are in the U.S. military as a reservist and you get called on active duty, your time in the 8A program is frozen. Now, it should I, be. Yeah, but it, but it, it wasn't. Be be, yeah, because it was not. Um, and, and and everybody said it was. It, it, you know, it, they would have to make an executive order to, to make that change. And uh, so we actually went after it and we made the change. And uh, uh, and I was acknowledged at an SBA meeting down, down in Philadelphia because of that. But I was not able to to be grandfathered in. But so all the companies now you know benefit from that. I was going to ask you, were you were you even able to benefit from it? Yeah. So yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. That sounds like one of the, the challenges and obstacles and anything else yeah. that you can remember. Yeah. So when when you look at uh, uh, the, the whole financing piece, so uh, when, when I won the contract at CDC, I had a mentor by the name of Walter Lomax in Philadelphia. And Walter Lomax had been a uh, been a physician that uh, had started a business uh, having docs in different prisons and and he had you know other IT companies and I went to talk to him about my funding problem and uh, to manage this project at CDC and 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 uh, he pointed out to me the difficulty in getting funds and uh, and he said 
I'll help you. And I mm. said, I'm not coming to you for help. He said, I know you're not. That's why I'm going to help you. And mm. I said, I, I, I told him, Dr. Lomax, I do not want your help. I need you to explain to me how to do this. So I ended up going to a bank that had a uh, SBA loan program, and I was able to get the loan. Uh, uh, so I, because the bank in my local town would not give me the money because they said, what happens if CDC closes down? Uh, and I asked them, are you, are you, you gotta be kidding me. This is the centers for disease control. They're not going to close down. Mm -hmm. and that, that bank came to me later on after I, you know, received several contracts and apologized, but it's, it's interesting to see how, you know, you're treated when you're, when you're on top compared to when you're, sure. you're, 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 you're not on top. But what happened over the years, I had uh, several projects. And, and 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 people understand business is up and down, so I you know I did extremely well, and then I hit a I I I, I hit a downfall that hit me, like 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 you would never know you could be hit that hard. I used to run all the uh, dog programs for the military, so I took care of fifteen hundred dogs uh, for DOD in San Antonio, Texas, and bred the dogs for the military and the TSA program. So I was probably the largest dog person in the world, really, and and uh, and that, those were great contracts. Wow! And, and because of uh, President Obama's executive order for insourcing, I lost all those contracts overnight, and all those all of my employees became government employees. So I lost a lot of work, learned some key lessons about. Uh, what to do when something like that happens, which I share with businesses all the time now so people don't make the same mistake. But what happened financially from a banking position, it devastated me. And the bank that I had basically said, oh, we can't, we, we can't help you anymore. And because um, and, 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 and they, they said, I don't, I don't think you're going to pull out of this. So, you know, I did the grind just like, you know, when I got back from Iraq, you know, I did the grind, built the business back up. So I was able to build it back up. And I was at, uh, and, and Sharon, I don't want you to take this the wrong way because, uh, you know, you and I had a, just real friendly words one day. It was at one of the golf programs over at Woodmore and, you know, I, I just finished playing golf and there was a table that said VIPs only. And I was uh -huh. looking for a place to sit and, and uh, you know, you know, Roland Martin was there and I had been, you know, just joking with him about HBCU school. So I'm thinking I'll sit here with Roland and some other people and have a great time. Mm -hmm. And you said, well, this is for the VIPs. And I said, well, who's a VIP? You know, and she said, I'll tell you what. Why don't you sit over there? You got Marriott there, you got MT Bank, and you got so all right. So I go over there and I sit down. Now I'm in a situation where I need some more relationships. And I'm sitting down next to MT Bank. And this young vice president starts talking to me. And um, and we just had this conversation. And I'm looking at him as a young vice president. I know exactly who you're talking about. Uh -huh. yeah, and, and he told me he could. You know, he, he asked me about my business and I told him and then he told me, you know, he, you know, he, he he'd like to follow up with me. And I'm thinking, oh, man, you know, my problem is a little bit too, I think, a little bit too big for you. You know, and he said, no, you know, let me come out. So he came out and and I would tell you, it's probably one of the best meetings and and one of the the, the best times that I have spent. So I don't know, it cost me like a 100 bucks to be in the golf tournament or something, but you know, it was well the return, well, the return on that time, right? It was, it was it's it's huge. It was it's it was it was it was so huge, it's amazing. And uh uh and now I have like several like when people talk about banking relationships, I have like really true hardcore banking relationships with that particular bank. And um uh, and I feel so good about it because I could be trying to do anything 
and I call them up and they're like, Hey, no problem. What do you need? You know? And uh, so it's that, that, that the importance. So I say that for two things. One, um, it's so hard to get funding, but uh, if, if you allowed me, Sharon, to sit at that VIP table, you're going to waste your time. Well, and I just would have been joking about HBCU schools and wouldn't have gotten anywhere. But you uh-huh. said, why don't you, go, why don't you go sit over there? Because I think that'd be a good table for you. You uh-huh. know, and I sat over there and, uh, uh, and I can even tell you how other stories because Marriott was there and, um, I ended up getting into the hotel business also, which is a whole nother story. See, I, see, I should have done it. Cause you know why? Because I came up with that idea of when you come off the green, we would set up these corporate round tables right, right, for right. MBEs um, because you know, the rule is you don't talk it on the, on the course, but right. if you could have lunch with someone, cause that the young man you're talking about didn't play. Right, 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 right. He plays to host that he came to host he's a sharp young man yeah, he yeah. came to host that round table so yeah. i never knew that story so my idea worked so, 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 yeah. <laughs> so the funny thing about it a couple of weeks ago uh he called me up on a, on a sunday about nine o'clock at night and and, and, I, and I picked it up because i saw his name because he would never call me and he had just recently brought a dog and his dog was quick and uh, uh, and it, was, it really had a, a, a allergic reaction, which was really oh, no. bad. And, uh, and he was like, you know, what do I do? You know, who? And I said, well, you know, there's there's two good emergency clinics, but I said you're gonna it's probably gonna cost you about three to four grand, Ooh. you know, to, to take care of this problem. And I said, or you could do this and give your your dog this three times a day for the next couple of days, and you'll probably be fine. Uh, but I probably shouldn't be telling you that because I haven't seen your dog and I don't have a client patient relationship with you, but you know, wink, wink, I would probably do that and try to say three or four grand. And he did that and it cured his dog and he's, you know, save the dog. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, but I mean, I'm so glad I could help him because he's, he's helped me out, uh, tremendously, uh, in any time of need, uh, that I've ever had, you know. That is so, so good to hear. Yeah. I never knew that, Dr. McConnell. So, I never yeah. knew that. And yeah. so that sounds like some some great obstacles. Let me just ask you a couple of questions as we kind of bring this to closure. Yeah. What has what has the pandemic? So you've had some highs and lows, oh, tied sure. to some very um, um, important times during during the the course of your business. But how has the pandemic um, impacted your business and um, and what advice do you have there for folks that are going through it? Yeah, so for me, I think the other downfalls or the other obstacles probably helped me uh, to get through the pandemic. Uh, so, you know, I always look at it as an opportunity. Like you look at a, you know, when, and, and I try to tell people when we have a war, it's like one of the worst things that that you could ever have, but I guarantee you there are people, you know, you know, seeking the opportunities of war. Mm-hmm. So when the pandemic hit, it wasn't necessarily I came out to really look at and seek opportunities because of a, a, a pandemic. I sat down with my staff and and had a brainstorming meeting and said, "Okay, this is what's happening." Now, how do we get through this? Now, most of my contracts, I was able to maintain the people on contracts and make it work from home uh, because a lot of the work that we do, if it's research and animals, those people still had to go to work uh, because they had to take care of the animals. But positions that I had that were administrative, like people were able to uh, uh, to work from home, but I knew we were going to have dips. And what what would happen? Uh, I, I keep a very very large network of uh, people, and I let people know when I'm down, and I let people know what I do. And there's a a, a young lady that had called me, and she was on the uh, White House team, and they were looking for supplies, and and she told them, you know, I I, I know a business, 
uh, that the guy has a military background, and mm-hmm. I know he doesn't have him, he can get it. And uh, she called me up on a Saturday because they, they were working. And, um, and then that's when I started realizing that there was a serious problem in getting supplies. And I knew there was a problem, but I didn't realize how bad it was. So we had to regroup and figure out how can we help customers that need supplies? And then the suppliers that we buy things from couldn't get supplies also. So I said, if I can become... Uh, a link even for those larger organizations that cannot procure stuff, uh, you know, that could be a win-win for us. And that's, and that's, so that was one of the approaches that, that, that we did. We looked at our customers and we, we, and we called them up and, and looked at their problems. So it, we, you know, we called the NIH up and, uh-huh. and uh, there's a, um, a warehouse within NIH where they basically, provide supplies to a lot of the different institutes and we know the people that do the buying and we call them up and said, what is it that you can't get? And that's one of the things that we've always been good at in, in, in finding things and doing projects that most people don't want to do. Most people don't want to work with anthrax or a bowler. So, you know, we'll do that. So when it comes to supplies, you know, they couldn't get thermometers and they needed thermometers like right away. So mm-hmm. we we were able to get them and 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 I hand carried them to them, so they would have them like you know right away. And then they needed masks and they needed gowns. And then and then you know not so much looking at you know some people will call it a pivot, but I looked at the need. So when you look at the PPE world, sure needed it. So a lot of people don't realize that funeral parlors have to have PPE supplies, but nobody had supplies. So I looked at not only the medical side, but what are the other places that need PPE supplies? And let's go after those markets also, because everybody's not going to be that resource to them. Uh, So, you know, fortunately, again, I grew up in the DC area. uh, So I know some of the family owned funeral parlors and I asked Mm -hmm. them, what are your problems? And they mm-hmm. said, we can't get gowns, we can't get gloves. And I, and I said, I got gowns, I got gloves. And uh, so we were able to, to uh, support a lot of people that we would n- you know, normally not support. There's a, uh, a well-known uh, uh, construction business in the area that needed a lot of PPE stuff. That's one of the Minority Supplier Development Council members. And he had the same problem because he had to keep things running and he had to have his staff with masks on and then they had to have gloves and sanitizers and that's a business that we had never gone after we had never looked at the construction business because people look at us you know supporting research and medical related stuff so we actually were able to increase our business by tapping into other areas and then um, when you look at universities universities were trying to figure out what to do and then a lot of towns what i call like in the black belt so i spent a lot of time in alabama because again that's where a lot of my you know roots came from in a, in a pivotal point in my life so yeah. i called down to tuskegee and called the health center and i said what are your pain points and they said we don't have we have two masks we have one wow. gas- and I said, how does that happen in Tuskegee, Alabama? Right. And, and I said, what do you need? And they told me what they needed. And they said, well, we haven't gotten enough funding. I said, don't worry about it. I'm sending it to you. Wow. And 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 uh, because that's a place that, you know, should not have problems today. But what happened, that doctor contacted all the doctors in Alabama and said, let me just tell you what the McConnell Group did. And then the next thing I know, we're getting orders from other places in Alabama because of our gift to a little health clinic in Tuskegee, Alabama. Mm. So it's interesting how things, you know, go around. And and uh, so we had ended up, you know, we had to hire a couple more people uh, because we were getting more orders than we had ever gotten before. And, and again, being in biomedical research, uh, you know, I'm probably, you know, 
saying too much where people may try to jump in my business space. But when you look at uh, uh, biomedical research, people have to have the same PPE on to do biomedical research. So if you're doing mm. uh, uh, work with primates, you have to have gowns on, you have to have masks and, and uh, you have to have goggles and face shields and, and none of that stuff was available. So uh, we became that supplier uh, at, a, at a larger number uh, than we had before because we reached out to them and we knew they couldn't figure out how to get it. So we started buying direct from China. Uh, we put a warehouse up in Frederick, Maryland uh and and it it, it 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 changed the way we do business today yeah. and it sounds like you bring to the party all this accumulation of wealth of knowledge and whether it was from your time in tuskegee whether it was your time in the in exactly. the service whether your time in, in the reserve because as i'm listening to you and i said that sounds like the army in him he could logistically put that stuff together really fast um yeah. and that's what i admire about about folk with military backgrounds in terms of being able to see that problem and to go after it do you look at that as as we as as the pandemic kind of progresses on and we're looking at things now like the variants that are coming up, but you know, things are getting together with the vaccine and that kind of thing. And then you look at what's happening in the corner of the world called India. Mm -hmm. um, do you see kind of opportunities there or what do you see in the future as we look at this pandemic from your vantage point? Yeah. So one of the things that we 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 just completed. So uh, Thermo Fisher pumped out uh, 10 historically black colleges by providing the supplies and equipment to set up COVID laboratories. And one of the historically black colleges contacted us and asked us, could we really, could we set the lab up for them and then staff it? Uh, so we just completed that task. And, uh, and that was a lot of fun for us because again, uh, from an operational standpoint and understanding operational readiness, we were able to look at what they had, uh, go through the process to ensure that they get CLIA certified, which is having a clinical lab, and then finding the people uh, to staff. And because all these things are getting harder and harder to do right now. So uh, the opportunities are, are not just, you know, local, it's, 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 it's actually at a global setting. So if people had connections in India, uh, this is the time uh, to actually get involved uh, uh, with India. I was over in India with uh, Governor O'Malley uh, uh, and uh, uh, Rashawn Baker when they had the the uh, uh, the, the it was more of a uh, biomedical uh, trip uh, going over, and they had the president of the University of Maryland. So I had I was able to see you know India firsthand and look at the opportunities there and with COVID hitting there. And, and that's, you know, it's almost like a, I wouldn't call it a pivot. I just call it more of a lateral extension of what you do. So if you look at what you do now, you could literally look at India and look at how you could apply the, the skill sets and, and, and your capabilities in India. But a lot of people, you know, we just don't, look at these other opportunities because it seems like it's a long way. And there's all kind of programs to help you get through those hurdles. But we, you know, many of us just don't know about them. Again, which, 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 helped, which has helped me is literally being in the military. So I've been all around the world and I understand cultures and I understand how to work with embassies and I understand USAID, I understand World Bank, I understand the Inter-American Development Bank. And these are places that a lot of us don't think about looking at opportunities. Like a lot of people go to the federal government or they go to the industry. They don't realize you could go on the World Bank website right now and you'll see contract opportunities. You can go to the Inter-American Development Bank, which is right downtown Washington, D.C., and they have contract opportunities. But my military background gave me the insight for all of that. So, um, you know, at some point, I just really know I need to just stop working because there's so much work out there that you can continuously do. Uh, and, and, I, and I challenge people, you know, if, if, if you can't find business, and, 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 and I get calls from this all the time, I gave a talk to the, uh, uh, the veterans group, um, 
the uh, VIP group here in Maryland. And I must have got 10 phone calls just trying to help veterans understand how to find business because there's, there's this business out there. It's like people tell me you can't find a job. There's, there's so many jobs out there. And I tell people, look at who just won a contract. If you look at, if you don't have a job, you know, you, you know, you can go on sam.gov, betasam.gov. You can see who won a contract. Look at if it's in, you know, science, if it's in communications. And I guarantee you that company needs people like you. And that's another, that's, you know, you'll not read that in a book. It's just another way of looking at where the opportunities are. I think I've learned so much today in terms of the, the lateral, not looking at it as pivotal as opposed to being the lateral connection, I mean, extension, to look at your relationships. So it's like the, your relationships throughout this, this whole cycle in terms of the longevity of your company, it's also been about the collection of your relationships and then looking beyond what you can see and understand that what else you can do. I think that is that they, they are all great, great lessons. Okay. And guess what, Dr. McConnell, you are our VIP. You are, <laughs> you're absolutely our VIP. Well, thank you. So, so I thank you. You know what? I will always remember at the, you were one of our top 100 Minority Business Award winners and our last top 100. Um, and, and the conversation you had with my granddaughter who is very interested in being a veterinarian. And so, you just seem like the kind of person is always giving of himself, evident by the, the, the or always demonstrated by the things that I see you do. And so, on behalf of the world, we say thank you yeah, for everything pleasure. that you do. Um, very interesting story. Wish I had more time to talk about it because I know there's lots more story here, but there was an untold story as far as we were concerned that I think that we uncovered today. And so, Dr. McConnell, thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Ladies and gentlemen, that is kind of like the um, end of this particular episode, but it does not, it's not the end of our story. We will continue to um, bring to you the untold story or stories rather of minority businesses. As we kind of wind out, I want to actually um, thank some more sponsors if we can um, look at that. And for those who are just listening, uh, we, we certainly want to thank AARP, AT&T, BAE Systems, Bank of America, BWI, Thurgood Marshall International Airport, Dominion Energy, The Ellison Group, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, FRS, Horseshoe Casino, Horse, um, Casino or Caesars Entertainment, Ideal, Lidos, Lockheed Martin, m and Bank, we're just talking about them, Marriott, McCormick, Metropolitan Washington Airport Authority, um, National Bit Network, Northrop Grumman, Peapod, Sodexo, Truist, United States Postal Service, Washington Gas, Metro, WSSC Water, Wells Fargo, and Zillion Technologies. Until the next time, we'd like to thank our production company, Graybo, and I'd like to thank the, our team, the CRMSCC Business Consortium that consists of the Council, the um, MBDA Business Center, Washington, D.C., the MBDA Federal Procurement Center, in particular, go to www.crmsdccares.com to not only see this episode again and again, but to see um, our other episodes as well, as well as our webinars and, the, and all the newsletters and, and the plethora of information that we've placed out during the last year or so. And so we know um, just how important this information is and we are appreciative of the opportunity to bring it with you. And so until next time, um, stay tuned and we'll see you again. Thank you.